was never the one to write up a song for just anyone. I I was always the one to find myself lost in long conversations. Oh, 'cause I've always been told that things will unfold. Hey guys, Arlisha here and welcome to another video. This week we are going to be doing another limited color palette thing and we're going to be focusing on Payne's Grey this week, which I'm really excited about. It's a beautiful and widely varying color, which is why I wanted to start by swatching some Payne's Greys from a bunch of different brands. You're going to notice that the colors vary quite a bit from one another and that just has to do with the fact that Payne's Grey isn't like ultramarine, blue, or burnt sienna, colors that are commonly known for being made up of one specific pigment. Payne's Grey varies a lot depending on the brand. So the blue that's used can vary depending on the brand, and some brands will use black or brown or like a PB19, like a quinacridone rose sort of color to get it closer to this blue-gray but it varies so much depending on the pigments that are used. Some brands will use ultramarine blue to give the color more granulation, while other brands will use like a phthalo blue, which gives a much stronger, higher staining blue tint to the color. So there's just so much variation and variety. The Holbein swatch that you're seeing in this list actually isn't Payne's Grey. It is Holbein's Neutral Tint, which I swatched by accident. They're right next to each other in the palette, and I don't have them labeled, so don't worry, you will see Holbein's Payne's Grey soon, because it's the one that I decided to use for my little trio of colors and for the final piece. Some of these versions are a little bit closer to like an indigo, while some of them are closer to a blue black, and it's just super fascinating to see them all side by side. Some granulate a lot more than others, and again, that all comes down to the different pigments that are used and the amounts of each pigment. When I was trying to decide what colors I wanted to pair with Payne's Grey, I was originally thinking of doing just two colors, so maybe a yellow to get some nice variations of green, a red would give me some purples, or a brown could be really interesting for neutralizing the Payne's Grey. Maybe I'll do that in the future, maybe I'll focus on a brown and then see what kinds of colors I want to mix with that. But for this one, I decided to go with a triad sort of a yellow red blue using Payne's Grey as the blue. I wish I could tell you the specific names of the yellow and red that I'm using here, but I don't know exactly what colors they are. I do know that these are all Holbein. The yellow is a cool yellow, maybe a lemon yellow. It's most likely lemon yellow by Holbein. And the red is more of a cherry, quinacridone, corally sort of red that I really, really love. And I love these two colors together. This is probably my favorite yellow and red together because I love that red mixed with just a little bit of yellow. That peachy color is one of my favorite colors to mix and it's one of my favorite colors to paint with. And it gives me a really, really lovely shade, those two together but things get really moody when you mix in that Payne's Gray. So even though the color can look closer to a blue-black on its own, it still mixes really interesting purples and greens when mixed with the yellow and the red. In my final piece, I wanted to focus on these darker mixes with the Payne's Gray because it's kind of the focus for today. So you're not going to be seeing lots of those oranges and red mixes of the yellow and the red. I wanted the other two colors to complement the Payne's Gray a little bit more, so I focused pretty heavily on that one. Because I'm using three colors instead of just two this time, I thought it would be a good opportunity to attempt another color wheel. This time, I really wanted the colors to be a little bit more evenly spaced than the tired, wonky looking color wheel that I had done previously. So I did a rough little grid of 12 spaces. I say rough and I do mean rough because they're definitely not super even, but I wanted the colors to be evenly spread out and just be, you know, make an attempt at, at something a little bit more organized. And I really like the way these colors work together. It's it's really, really interesting. On the one side where the yellow and the red are, things are much warmer and a bit earthy because the colors are a little bit cooler, so they don't mix like a super vibrant red. And then closer to the paints gray, things get a little bit more 
moody and misty and they're just they're so nice together i really like them there's something in my brain i don't know exactly what it is that tells me that when you do a color wheel you have to do it all in one go so i i, I don't know what that is but it's like my brain tells me i can't go over swatches again like make a second layer i have to do everything perfect the first time which basically never happens and usually the result is that I'm unhappy with my color wheels because I feel like I failed somehow but for this one I just went over a couple swatches again to make the color a little bit more vibrant and just make everything a little bit more but I don't know what that is in my brain that it's it's weird anyway move, moving on As I have been doing with these limited color paintings, I did a tiny little color comp thumbnail just to get a rough idea of the colors I wanted to use and where I wanted to put them. Using limited palettes like this is starting to feel like the only way I want to paint. Like, it really has helped me focus on communicating a color story with each painting. So trying not to get distracted by using tons of different colors in one painting. And that doesn't mean that I can't use colors for specific purposes and give each color a job, so to speak. But using limited palettes like this has been actually really, really, really helpful for me in, you know, just thinking about what I want each piece to communicate as far as color. And for this piece in particular, I wanted everything to be much darker than these little circles that I had masked out. So I originally wanted to use my masking fluid for those circles, but I couldn't find it. And I had a feeling it was put away in a box in the closet with a few other art supplies that I don't use as often. And I really didn't want to go uh, digging through that closet to find my masking fluid. So I just cut some little wobbly, uneven circles from masking tape, and I was like, okay, we're gonna try this and see how it works. And it actually worked pretty perfectly for what I wanted. I knew I didn't need perfect circles because I was gonna kind of fade out those edges later on, but I didn't trust myself to maintain the white of the page without the tape, so I'm really glad that I masked those out. I, I wanted to challenge myself with this piece by adding in a couple other elements. So I wanted this to have more of a fantasy atmosphere to it. So I have um, a figure, you know, but only half of a face this time. I wanted the face to not really be as much of a focal point. I wanted it to be interesting, but not the primary focus. And uh, she has antlers and there appear to be little, little orbs of light hanging for, I, I, it feels way less mystical when I sit here and explain the pieces. I really should stop doing that. But anyway, I wanted to explain some of my thought process to you guys. So I masked out the circles and then worked the color in around them, trying to keep that area a bit lighter. So most of the Payne's Gray is focused around the outside and even the face I wanted to get lost a little bit and I wanted it to be there and I wanted it to be interesting and part of the piece but definitely not the place where the eye is most drawn so pretty much all of these mixes had at least a little bit of Payne's gray in them and I think that that was pretty helpful for establishing atmosphere with this painting and it worked out pretty much for the most part overall I also taped off the edges on this painting which I definitely didn't have to do because it's on a block like it's a watercolor block so all the edges are gummed and I didn't have to worry about it warping or anything like that. There was just something about having a lot of darker values all the way around the piece that made me want to tape off the edges so that I could have a white border around the outside instead of the paint going all the way to the edges of the paper. I, I can't even explain why specifically I did that, but in the end, I'm glad I did. I feel like it gives the piece a little bit more of like a storybook feeling to me. I, I don't even know. I don't know what I'm talking about, but anyway, I'm happy that I did that. And there were just a few things that I don't usually do that I tried in this piece and that was fun. So um, I don't know if I've ever painted antlers before. So this is a first attempt at that. I kept the shapes pretty abstract and definitely didn't render them out very, very, very much at all. But I, I like that. I like that 
it's just large chunks of shapes and it feels a little bit hazy it feels a little indistinct and it just it's it's basically what i wanted it to be i will say i had a really really hard time with this painting i struggled so much to get it done while i was working on it the first day i i ended up it took me it, this painting happened over the course of like five days which is way longer than usual for me usually if i can't get a painting done in like one or two sittings over the course of an hour to two hours i i usually don't want to finish it and i was very close to giving up on this painting many times and that was due to several things. I, I feel a very strong need lately to try new things and to branch out and just spend some time studying, learning more about watercolors and learning more about so many things like a lighting and anatomy. Like I just feel like I need to go back to the basics in so many ways. And I haven't really been giving myself the time to do that because usually when I make art, it's for work and i'm gonna see about maybe incorporating more of that study learning time into my work and just sharing that with you guys i think that could be really interesting but anyway i was seeing so many things while working on this piece that i knew i could do better if i took the time to study and learn and working on a finished piece for a video for me is a different mindset than taking the time to study and learn about something so i i don't know it, it's just a it's a weird thing anyway so the whole time during this piece i was telling myself i don't know enough about lighting or antlers or color mixing to to do this piece the way i want it to so i was just kind of beating myself up the whole time another thing that i did differently while working on this piece that i pretty much never do is i was trying to watch a, a show like I had my iPad next to me and I was watching the show Heroes I don't know if you guys it was like it was running from like 2006 to 2010 and I have actually seen it before I watched it closer to when it first came out and I remembered really liking it then I don't know why we're talking about TV shows now but I had really liked watching the show Heroes it had a lot of things that I love like characters to enjoy and superpowers and you know th things that I just generally like so i was trying to watch that but i couldn't really focus even if i wasn't looking at the show my mind was thinking about the show and trying to do that and paint something that i wanted to be anything was just turned out to be really impossible so that first few days of painting i i was kind of beating myself up not realizing why i wasn't making very much progress and then came back to it the last day and was like you know what maybe i shouldn't try to watch a show <laughs> while I'm painting that doesn't usually work very well for me unless it's Doctor Who I can paint while I watch Doctor Who because I've seen every episode like six times at this point so uh, Doctor Who's good for painting but other than that I need to either listen to music or an audiobook those things are fine for painting but no no heroes no way that needs like so some non-painting attention and if you've seen the show uh, let me know what you think of it. I have uh, different different feelings towards the show <laughs> than I did when I watched it when I was younger. And uh, I don't know, I guess we could save that for talking about in the comments because this has been a very long tangent, but that's okay because I didn't really know what I was going to talk about anyway. I don't know if it was the paper that I was using or if it was this particular brand of paint, I think it may have kind of been a combination of both, but I'm leaning a little bit more towards thinking it was the paint. There was a lot of color shifting going on while I was working on this piece. So normally with watercolors, you know, you paint something on, it dries a little bit lighter, that's pretty standard. But I feel like it was happening a lot with this piece. It can also be attributed to individual colors, so maybe it's something that um, this Payne's Gray does a lot. By the way, I started using Holbein's Payne's Gray, which is what I told you guys I was going to use, but I ran out like a quarter of the way through the painting. I had used all of the Payne's Gray in the palette, and I wanted to use one that was similar to Holbein's Payne's Gray, so I switched over to Sennelier. So I ended up with two different palettes next to me while I was painting, which was a little disorienting, but I would say about, you know, maybe well, more than half of the painting was actually done with Sennelier's Payne's Gray, and then I used the Holbein Red and Yellow because I ran out of the Holbein Payne's Gray. So anyway, that, that was happening. And yeah, there was lots of color shifting, so I had to do 
tons of layers to build up the value and the vibrancy on this one. Overall, it does still have like a nice muted look to it and the lightest values are in those orbs of light near the top, which is exactly what I wanted for this piece. I knew I was going to go in with some white gouache mixed with the colors to provide a little bit more depth and opacity in some areas, and it turned out pretty much how I thought it would in my head. Of course, my brain's always beating me up for not knowing about certain things, but the only way I'm going to know how to do things in the future is to take the time to learn them. So I'm excited to do that in time, hopefully with you guys, and, and to share that with you. This original piece will be for sale on my shop. I'm not sure if I'm going to do prints of this one or not. If you're interested in prints, let me know down in the comments. Let me know if you have a favorite Payne's Gray that you like to use. Um, I used Holbein and Sennelier today, and I do really like ones from other brands, but I'd love to know what's your favorite Payne's Gray. Let me know what you think of the piece. Let me know how you feel about Payne's Gray and all the things. Let me know how you feel about Heroes and Doctor Who, because, you know, because why not? And I will talk to you guys in next week's video. Thanks for hanging out with me. Bye bye. Yeah, you, you're making me want to try forever. I feel so free. Oh, my sweet baby.